I really, I really just want to express how much I love God. Just right off the bat, how good he is and how amazing my God is. Our God is. That even in my weakness, the song says, that he gives me the strength. That even though when I might be a good father, my God still loves me. That even though I might be in my sin, my God still loves me. That even when I was in my sin, before I knew Christ, when I was an enemy towards him, the Bible says, he still loved me. And he still loves you. What an amazing God we serve. Amen? Amen. I'm just so excited. I'm so excited to be able to share with you. This, this day, I was, I was super nervous. I was like, I really don't want to do this. And I was like, what a privilege it is to share about God's glory and how good God is. To glorify his name. What, there is no greater privilege to do that. To magnify our Lord and our God because he is so good and he is so great and he is worthy to be praised. Amen? Amen. I want to say thank you to Pastor Anthony and Pastor Manny for letting me come and share this work with you. We have amazing pastors. Amen. Let's get them a hand clap. Amen. They're absolutely amazing. I'm so glad to be part of Venture Church. And if you don't know me, my name is Deshaun Carraway. I'm the Southeast Campus Pastor. So I'm always over there on uh, Sundays. And so glad to see all my church family and people I don't see all the time. But so wonderful to be able to share with you this evening. We're going to be in Psalms chapter 16. Psalms chapter 16 is going to be our first scripture. And it says this, keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my God. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say to the holy people who are in the land, those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour our libertations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion in my cup. You make my lot secure. The border lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who, who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord with him at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My, bottle also, my body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of, realm of death, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Let's pray. Father God, Louise, thank you for your word. Father God, I ask that you will use me now, Father God, to speak to your people about who you are and who we are in you. Father God, I stand against the enemy, Father God who wants to divide people from you, Father God. But, Lord, may your spirit draw people towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to come back to Psalm 16 in a little bit. But what I really want us to understand as we really, before we drive into that scripture is to understand what David understood about God, what he really understood, that he's able to write something like this as he is glorifying God and seeing all these good things in God. And the first thing I want you to know that David knew is God, God is about his glory. God is about his glory. He wants to be glorified. Many people have struggles with this. As I was preparing for this message, I found out that actually Oprah, she gave up her faith at the age of 27 because she found out that God said, I am a jealous God. She was like, how can a God, how could a God say that? Well, I got in Exodus 34, it says it even stronger. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and cut down their astral poles. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord your God, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. He said, I'm more than jealous. I am, my name is jealous. You could call me jealous. He said, I, no, you will worship me and me alone. We see in Deuteronomy, it says this, you shall not make for yourself any image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath 
or in the, in, in the waters below. You should not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for their sin, the, for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. I think God is serious that he wants our worship and that he is a jealous God. There's one other scripture I want you to see in Isaiah 42. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. I am the Lord thy God. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. God said, no, I deserve to be glorified. I deserve to be worshipped. God is all about his glory. He's all about his glory. And he says, I will not share with anyone else. Now, right away, it could be something in you that says, ugh, I don't like that. Because who wants to be around the person that's all about them? You don't want to be around that person. Right? So why is it okay for God to do this? If I could, with this story, sort of bridge this with my next point. Um, if, if it's my wife's birthday and, and I, I get home before she does and I buy her all the stuff she wants, I go buy the shoes she's been wanting, I go buy the purse that she's been wanting, I go buy her cake and ice cream and I, I buy her flowers, which I actually won't buy her flowers anymore. Man, flower, I, went to an actual <laughs> I went to an actual flower shop and it was like 80 bucks. I'm like, you could have went to what, Ulta, Ultra, whatever, you bought all kinds of makeup. Like why the heck would I spend <laughs> $80, or at least go to Costco or Vons or something, buy, you know, something. But I was like, that's ridiculous. So every, everything, everything but the flowers. But I have all this stuff there waiting for her when she gets home. And she comes home, and, she's, and she sees all this stuff, and she's like, wow, why would you do all this for me? And I tell her, well, the Bible says i got to be a good husband, so i got to do something, right? I don't know. Like, <laughs> I got to do something. I don't, I don't, that's what the Bible says, right? Be a good husband. If I don't do something, you go tell pastor. Pastor, go come talk to me. It's like, I got to do something, right? Right? But if, but if that, same thing, that same thing happens, and, I, and she comes home, and I have all this stuff for her, and I tell her, you know what? I even got a babysitter to come and watch the kids so we can go out to dinner. And she asked me, why would you do all this for me? And I tell her, because I love to go out and buy all these things that you want for you. And there's no one in the world that brings me more joy spending the evening with than with you. Wouldn't that be much better? But you see, it's still, as I'm talking, all about me. It brings me joy to spend time with you. So how does that work? Because when you delight in someone... You honor them. When someone delights to spend time with you, you feel honored to spend that time with them, to be with them. There's something about them. And God is saying why God is not evil when he says, no, you glorify me because there's no one greater than him. Because he has something that no one else can offer. So when he's doing it, he's being loving. He's saying, no, get rid, of, get rid of all those distractions. For I am the God that can bring, make you satisfied. And then you're going to praise me. He is inviting us to be with him and be satisfied in him. That's why it's not evil for God to do it. Because where else is he going to send you? There's no one greater than he is. So he says, glorify me. Give me all the glory. Which leads me to my next point. God is about us being satisfied. You're like, how does that work? God is all about his glory, but God is also about us being satisfied. John Piper, he coined this, and a lot of what I got this message from is God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So how does that work? How does that play out? Well, my son, he, I, you know, 
it's good to have a kid around the house so he can grab stuff for you so you don't have to get up. I, I'm learning. <laughs> it's good. So I tell my son, hey, go get the remote. The only problem is as he gets close, he might chuck it at you. So we're still working on that part. But when he does it, I tell him, thank you. Thank you, because he's brought me, he satisfied me. So I automatically praise him. We do that all the time. Or your football team, they score a touchdown. Right away, you're like, yay, give people half a high fives, because what? It satisfies you. So you automatically praise it or glorify it. I remember going to a Lakers game, and I don't like the Lakers. I'm a Spurs fan. And they were playing the, they were playing the Celtics, and then we went to game five, and we went to game seven. It's when they beat the Celtics in the finals. And people were high-fiving, going crazy, and I was like, I don't like the Lakers. But I had to go along with it because I didn't want to get beat up. I'm like, okay, we got we to gotta go, go do this. But I'm the worst person to take to a sports game because I really don't cheer. It was funny, as I was thinking about this, Nothing really gets me excited. It was one time I, I watched uh, Formula One racing. It's one of my favorite things to watch. And I remember one, the only one time I remember cheering. I can't remember what happened, but something happened. I was sitting on the couch, and I got up, and I went like this, and I just stopped. Like, what did I just do? Like, <laughs> like that was, I was like, this is crazy. But I say that to say that's all in us. Even the quietest, meekest of us. I, I remember the time I cheered for something because it hardly ever happens. But it's in us that we glorify something that satisfies us. That's in our nature. So that's why God's saying, no, come and glorify me. And God is all about you being satisfied. Because when God is most satisfied, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is all about it. Because God, God's number one party, remember, is him being glorified. It's his glory. That's the thing he cares about the most. But God is most glorified when you are most satisfied. So God wants to satisfy you so he can be most glorified. That is God's goal. That's what God wants. Another person who had a problem with this is C.S. Lewis. And he says something that's, that's crazy. I didn't even write it down. But he, he called God like, like a, a, a whining housewife, something crazy. And I was like, I was like, what? But he, but he had a problem with this, and he, this is what he wrote. I think we delight to praise, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appropriate consummation. It is not out of, it is, is it not out of, it is not out of, uh, a compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it's expressed. The Scottish uh, Catechism says that, th that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But we, but we shall then know that these are the same thing. Fully to enjoy is to glorify in commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. So when God commands that we glorify him, he is saying, come and enjoy me. Come, be satisfied by me. I have something greater than anyone else can offer. So I gave you this information. Now what, now what do you do with it? I say this, church family, let's go and seek pleasure and joy and happiness and peace. Let's go seek it with all that we have. But I say this, let's go seek it at the highest level. And that highest level, we find it seek to be satisfied in God. There's no one else that can satisfy you like our God can. There's no one that can bring pleasures like our God can. There's no one that can bring joy like our God can. So go and seek it, but seek it at its highest level. Seek it in God. In Psalms 34, it says this, In my desperation I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a, is a guard. He surrounds me and defends me, all who fear him. 
Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his, ho- his godly people, for those who fear him will have all that they need. Even the strong, strong, uh, even the strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. That is the promise that our Lord and our God makes us, that when you seek all your joy, all your fulfillment in him, you will lack no good thing. Now let's go back to Psalm 16, our first scripture that we read, and see, as we know this, this is what David knew. Remember when he went and stood against Goliath, he was like, who is this, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to go against my God? To disrespect him and his glory. David understood this from a young age, and that's what we see as he's writing these scriptures, as he's writing these psalms. This is the perspective that he is looking from. It says this, I say to the Lord, you are, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. You think he understands that the glorified God is where he is satisfied? That all good things come from him? In verse 4, it says, those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. He understands outside of God, there is no good thing. That you go to something else that will only disappoint you over and over again. You'll end up suffering more. We see it in the songs of Solomon, and I have time to put it in there. But he says, nothing was gained under the sun. Go and read it. He takes everything. Everything. He gets every single pleasure that you can have. And he said it was all worthless, worthless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. His son learned this from his father. In verse 6, it says this, The borderlines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Is there something that you want? A job that you want? A neighborhood that you want to live in one day? David said, hey, those borderlines have been, been knocked down. I have access to those things now. Amen. He understood that. Amen. That when I put God first and go to nothing else, that my God will provide for me things I thought I would never have. In verse 8, it says this, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Do things just always throw you off? Things, something goes wrong in your life and you simply just, you break down. You don't know what to do. God, David is telling this because God, he glorifies God that he will not be shaken. Because God satisfies him. God is his source. Verse 9 says, therefore my heart, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also, my body also will rest secure. That he says, look, I will find security and I will find rest in my God. Because I know I have all these things. Because I know that I praise my God. And if I go to any other God, it will fail me. But because my God has already showed me by tearing down these barriers around my life that I can have these pleasant things that I rest secure in my God. Because I glorify him above all else. Now, this sounds amazing, and, and I know if I was even sitting out there because of the, the old Baptist background that I have, and that, like, man, are you preaching this, this prosperity gospel? Don't you know the scriptures? Don't you know Luke 9, 23? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. That life isn't all roses. You're not just going to be satisfied all the time because you, you worship God. Don't you know? And I do know. I do know. My next point is joy is found in sacrifice. See, we still have this problem. We still have this problem. It's called sin. We still have this problem, and it's, it's called the flesh. We still have this problem, and it's this world that we live in, and it surrounds us, and you wake up with that sinful body every single day. So the joy is going to be found in sacrifice. In Matthew 13, it says this, 44, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, 
he, he hid it again, and, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. That man had to sacrifice something to get that treasure. And I'm here to tell you that that treasure is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it is worth sacrificing anything that stops you from getting to him. And there are many things that stop you from getting to him. That every day that flesh wakes up and tells you that you had to do something outside of God. That no, you should glorify yourself. Do what makes you feel good. God can't really satisfy you. The world's going to tell you that. Sex out of marriage is great. Why not? Sleep around. Why not? Why get married? That's what they're going to tell you. And you're going to be hit with that constantly from yourself and from the world. And you know what? All that stuff is going to sound good. No reason to lie about it. It's going to sound amazing. And so you're going to have to sacrifice, you're going to have to crucify that flesh and say, no, I trust my God. I will glorify him. I will put him at the center because I believe in his word and what he says is true. And it's going to feel, it's not going to feel good to do it. You don't want to diet, it never feels good. The cake is amazing. The ice cream is amazing. I like Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. He said Reese's Pieces. I love Reese's uh, Peanut Butter Cups. You throw them in the freezer, oh, man, I love them. They're amazing. Uh, they're amazing. And I don't like to get a four-pack. I like to get the, the bag, <laughs> hide it <laughs> in the freezer. Because no one looks in the freezer for candy, so it's the perfect place to even hide it, too. And they're so good frozen. But you're on a diet, but you're like, you want to get that result. But it's like, man, this is so good. He's like, no, I have to sacrifice. I know what I want that's going to make me satisfied on the end is there, but I have to sacrifice now. Are you willing to sacrifice to get that treasure? And realize that this man didn't come in to sacrifice out of, oh, but no, he found something great. It says, what joy. Because remember, I came out here, and I'll tell you about my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, and I have to remind myself daily of who he is and what he has done, because you will forget just like that. And you'll give in to those things. You'll give in to the world. You'll give in to the flesh. So you have to remind yourself of the joy that you have found, the treasure that you have found in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. That is the battle that we are going to have because we still have that sin problem. In John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. We have to believe this. We have to believe that God has the best for you. That we will put him first and we will glorify his name. And believe it. Believe how much our God loves us. Because God cares about his glory above all else. But because he cares about his glory so much, he wants you to be satisfied in him. Because when you're satisfied in him, he is most glorified. That is our Lord. That is our God. I want to give this example of Paul. In Philippians 1.21, he says this. For me, oh, sorry, I'll look at my notes. For me, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Can I sum it up in this? In, in Christ, I have more than life can give me. In my death, I have Christ, and that's, and that's more than get, death can take away from me. In Christ, I have more than life can give me. In my death, I have more than death can take away from me. What does that look like? That I am going to obey God, I'm going to trust God, I'm going to sacrifice whatever I need to sacrifice that I may live for God because he is going to satisfy me more than anything else can. That even in my death, that even though this, if I die today, I have to believe that I have something greater. But, but the thing is, I have two amazing kids. I have an amazing wife. I have an amazing father. I have an amazing, I have an amazing mother. 
I have amazing brothers and sisters. I have a great life. I have a great church. I have great friends. But Paul said, no, in my death, I have to believe in my death, I get something greater. Even though I leave all this behind, I get Christ, which is greater than all those things. This is the point that we are striving for. It's to understand and know how good God is like that. Because that is truly when you are satisfied. C.S. Lewis said, contentment, my friends, contentment is the greatest of all riches. That when you can come to a place where you're just, I am satisfied. I have all that I ever wanted. I tell you, church family, that only could be found in glorifying our Father, in glorifying the name of Jesus Christ above every other name, in receiving him as your Lord and Savior. So I leave you with this, is asking this question. As C.S. Lewis said, when God is commanding us to glorify him, he is simply inviting us to enjoy him. Will you enjoy our Father? Will you come and enjoy all the benefits, all the love that he has for you? I just want to read this last psalm. Oh, oh, what joy for those who disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record, whose record, rec, those who record the Lord as clear, clear of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I, refused, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confess all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. I say, will you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Will you glorify him above all else? Will you accept the invitation from God to enjoy him? Will you leave it all out there? Confess that sin to God and he will forgive you all of your guilt. It will all be gone. Church family, God commanding and demanding that we glorify him is a God that loves us. Amen. Can I pray for you? Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your word. And Father God, we lift you up because you are great and you are mighty, Father God. There is none beside you, Father God. You are great for, Lord, you spoke the world into existence, and there it was, Father God. Out of dirt, Father God, you made us, Father God. How powerful and how mighty you are, Father. We thank you for the salvation that we received through you, Father. Lord, that you loved us so much, Father God, that you sent your Son, Father God, to die on the cross for our sins, that we may be with you, Father God, that we may be in your presence, and have all the treasures, have all the joy that's at your right hand. Father God, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.